the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Last week, I tried to take up with you uh, something of a new approach uh, to the question of Jewish identity. Uh, Ahad Ha'am's approach of trying to define what was peculiarly Jewish in terms of the spirit, yet at the same time leaving out all religious terms and manifestations. Ahad Ha'am's definition was ethical to be sure, it was highly biblical, it was strongly nationalistic, it was spiritual without being religious. This in many ways made it a, a rather extraordinary uh, definition and a very valuable approach to a problem uh, which still faces the Jewish community. There are many people who find it difficult to be religious, as surely many people did in Achar Ha'am's time, and at the same time would like to preserve the special character and personality of the Jewish tradition, which has concerned itself with what I guess we would all, religious or non-religious, be willing to admit is the highest and the best in man. Achar Ha'am's understanding of what it meant to be a Jew was given, I think, largely in contrast to what Theodor Herzl and the political Zionists were trying to define uh, in terms of what being a Jew meant. To a person of Achar Ha'am's Jewishness, perhaps largely because of his East European background and his fine training in the Jewish tradition, but also perhaps because he knew and understood in a, an unusual and a sensitive way what Judaism had meant and could mean. Now, Achar Ha'am wanted to give a positive definition to what it meant to be a Jew, in contrast to Herzl's rather negative definition in terms of anti-Semitism, in terms of a lack of rights, in terms of a need to leave Europe and go elsewhere. Now it's interesting that Achar Ha'av's non-religious definition of what it meant to be a Jew was probably a little too religious for most of the East European and Central European Jews uh, who read him. I mean by that his continual use of the word spiritual smacked to them too much either of religion or of the German philosophy uh, from which it probably derived. It was too abstract, uh, too somehow both metaphysical and non-practical. It wasn't concrete enough, it wasn't specific, uh, to give them any real uh, answer to what they were looking for. By and large, I think that the Jews of Eastern and Central Europe were so oppressed in terms of their physical, the very economic problems of making a living, the, the difficulties of trying to find some way of surviving, that the question of Judaism as some sort of a spiritual entity, as some sort of a, of a mystic understanding of uh, what ethics ought to be and how they should be carried out, it didn't appeal to them. Now, to them it was enough to say we are Jews, we have a language, we have a tradition, we are a group who are oppressed and we need to rebuild our own lives. Socialism was a far more spiritual answer uh, to the Jews of Eastern and Central Europe than was Ahad Ha'am's understanding of ethics. But to this we will come at a later point. There is one thing, however, which Ahad Ha'am contributed by his effort to define Judaism on this spiritual plane, which I should like to continue and uh, follow through this evening. And that is his emphasis upon culture. For some reason, culture is a kosher word, and spirit is not. For some reason, what is involved in the manifestations of the human spirit as it expresses itself in art, in literature, poetry, the essay, the novel, this was acceptable to the Jews of Eastern and Central Europe. They, they enjoyed that, they liked that, they gloried in it. This was the Jewish people alive and expressing itself. Now when these forms were carried on through the Hebrew language, a Hebrew language which really hadn't known them before a few decades previous to Ahad Ha'am, it seemed as if indeed the Jewish people were alive. And instead of worrying about what its particular identity was, one simply gloried in its culture. 
here are its writers, here are its thinkers, here are the men who express its feelings. Now, by focusing attention upon this aspect of being a Jew, by making clear that Zionism without Jewish culture now, rather than Jewish culture defined in terms of the spirit, was essential, Achad Ha'am had performed a significant task. To be sure, in all these lectures, I always pick out a key individual and interpret an entire historical movement in terms of him. I do that for reasons of simplicity. I think it may be easier for you to remember and to understand. Um, and I believe it gives you his significance more specifically. And this is why really this man was a great man. He brought together many streams and currents which were moving in his time. Well, that's what Ahad Ha'am did. Ahad Ha'am brought together all those currents in the Jewish community which said that Zionism without Jewish culture is not complete. Zionism without Jewishness, expressed in terms of largely literature, is not a Zionism that means anything to us. Now, what happened then was that this period at the turn of the century and before World War I, and continuing after World War I, uh, particularly in the state of Israel. But this period, from the turn of the century to before World War I, saw the birth and the flowering of Jewish culture in its modern sense. There had been writers in modern Hebrew in the Haskalah, as we mentioned before. They laid the way, they prepared the foundation for this later, later birth of Hebrew culture. If Yudha laid Gordon and before him Moshe Chaim Lutzato and all of these earlier people had not taken the Hebrew language and tried to write uh, plays about biblical days, if Mahu hadn't written those first novels about biblical times, if uh, Yudha laid Gordon hadn't written his satirical poetry, Hebrew would not have come out of its ghetto shell. But because the foundation had been laid, that wasn't really the kind of culture one could say was really modern and alive. It's the kind of thing that critics sometimes complain about in dealing with Gaelic in Ireland. It's somehow as if you have to force yourself to use the Gaelic, that you don't really do artistic work yet in Gaelic because the Gaelic is not up to it. They're still creating the kind of living language out of which a work of art can come. But I think it's fairly clear that as the turn of the century approaches, what Ahad Ha'am had been talking about and hoping for, and what he continued to write about all during these periods, actually came to be. There was a living Hebrew culture. Its medium was the Hebrew language, a language which had now been freed from the traditional emphases of everything in biblical phrases or of uh, abstruse rabbinic allusions. Ahad Ha'am himself had, to be sure, contributed toward the birth of that language and toward that style. His essays are already modern essays. They can be read as one reads uh, any modern writer. One doesn't have the feeling any longer that this man is writing out of a Bible or writing out of a compendium of rabbinic works. This is a fresh language. It says what he wants to say. And the same thing was true for the writers who followed him and uh, came to be about this period. We are at the birth, then, of the Hebrew culture of which Ahad Ha'am spoke. But it's interesting that this culture has a, a double problem. The double problem is one which continues down to our present day, and as we shall see, sets up in term a problem concerning our theme. Namely, can one be a Jew in modern times simply by contact with modern Hebrew culture? This, after all, is the definition of Jewish identity which Ahad Ha'am uh, and those who follow him would give. To be a Jew in modern times is to participate in Hebrew culture. But there are two problems involved in Hebrew culture which are themes antagonistic one to the other. And these continue to our own day. Now, what are they? The first of these is the struggle to be somehow authentic. How can Hebrew culture somehow be legitimately recognized as Jewish culture. 
Now, one thing, obviously, is to express it in terms of the Hebrew language. To use the language, which has been traditional to the people, is already one way of maintaining the identity. The other half of the problem is Achar Ha'am's problem, namely, somehow remaining true to the spirit of the tradition. How does one somehow relate oneself, not just in form now, but in content, not just in the outward expression, but in the inner feelings, the sentiments, the attitudes toward the tradition? One might very well pick up an ancient language and write something in it, you see, that would be entirely against its spirit. One could translate the book of Leviticus into Greek, for example, but not thereby say that one therefore had a, a traditional Hellenic expression, simply because one had put it into that language. Well, that's the first problem. The first problem is authenticity, authentic Jewishness. And the hope is to solve that by using the Hebrew language and by remaining true to the spirit of what has gone before. But there's another half of the problem. It's not just enough somehow to be traditional in your Hebrew culture, not just enough to be a Hebrew. Somehow you've got to be a modern man as well. We wouldn't have the whole problem to begin with, remember, if we were all still in the ghetto. It's by virtue of the fact that we're out of the ghetto, that we're in modern society, that we recognize the inadequacy of the previous expressions of Jewishness that requires this whole enormous effort to understand who we are today and what it is that constitutes our Jewishness. Therefore, the question is, is this culture which is being produced up to the standards of modern culture? No, it might be enough at one time for a man to write a novel in Hebrew, and that's Hebrew culture. Because whoever wrote a novel in Hebrew, it's a tremendous accomplishment. But after a while, when people are writing novels in Hebrew, the question is, is it a worthwhile novel? The fact that it's in Hebrew is already no excuse. Now the thing is judged in terms of the rest of the cultural heritage. Once the trick has been mastered, once the language is alive, then the cultural competition is compared to anything else that's available. I had a recent experience. Someone had to bring me a present they felt. So as a result, they arrived in my house and they couldn't do anything better for me than to bring me a modern piece of Israeli art. This piece of Israeli art was a piece of plywood uh, on which had been scattered rather thick shavings, and that made the background. It was an oblong of five sides, and in the middle of which, someone had very cleverly taken slices of olive wood and walnut um, and by using these veneers, had put together a figure of Moses with the Ten Commandments. This was a wall hanging. Now, in the mind of the person who brought it, it came from the state of Israel. It was therefore Jewish art, and it was therefore good. But this illustrates my point perfectly. After a while, when one is not astonished any longer by the fact that there are Jews and there are artists, then the art productions have to be judged on the basis of are they good art or not. Now, this gentleman did not consider this piece in that light. His attachment to the piece was ideological. It came from the state of Israel, it was a piece of art, it was Jewish art, therefore you have to support it. But I think that the same point maintains. The problem of Jewish culture, sooner or later, becomes the problem of being culture. Is it good? Therefore, is it modern? Is it up to the contemporary standards and the like? Now, these are the twin problems of Jewish culture. And I'd like to discuss with you this evening how the leaders of the Jewish tradition, or the people who became the culture heroes of our folk in at the turn of the century and before World War I, slightly thereafter, went about solving these problems. In the first place, let's talk about the struggle for the Hebrew language. Now, it's very easy for me to stand here and say, so a man writes a novel in Hebrew, and uh, you know, the only question is, is it good or not? But we have to go back. We have to go back to the time of Achad Ha'am when Hebrew was still being forged as an instrument. 
Now I said, and I repeat, the Haskalah writers had taken the Hebrew of the past and somehow brought it up to date. But what the writers of the turn of the century did was they made it a modern language. They made it an instrument which could express any form that a modern man would wish to use. When we speak in a little while, as we shall, of Yalek and Chernikovsky, we are speaking of men who can hold their own in the Hebrew language with writers of whatever language of their time. They may not be the greatest of all the writers of the beginning of the 20th century, of Russia or Sweden or the United States. But clearly, among the cultural accomplishments of these decades is the writing in Hebrew. And it's not because it's written in Hebrew. It's because of what they did with it. The Hebrew language had become alive. But the full victory of the Hebrew language is connected not with the writers primarily. It is connected with an extraordinary man whose name you probably know, but about whom I must remind you, because the full impact of his victory is, I think, something that we tend to forget. His name is Eliezer ben Yehuda. I believe his original name was Moshe Perel, typical East European student of the tradition who makes his way to the Western University and decides to become a doctor but gets sick and then has to give up his studies as a doctor and goes uh, to Algeria for a while. Uh, there comes in contact with the Sephardic Jews, a contact which now affects the pronunciation of the Hebrew of almost all the Jews of the United States, and later makes his way uh, to what was then Palestine, today the state of Israel, and settles there. A rather typical story by this time uh, of our Jewish and Zionist leaders. But what is unusual about this man who calls himself Ben Yehuda, Eliezer Ben Yehuda? What is unusual about him is that he says openly and plainly and clearly until it becomes an article of religious faith. It's the only way that one can describe what he did for it. That there is no Jewish nationalism without the living Hebrew language. There can be no real Zionism without Hebrew as the instrumentality through which Zionism expresses itself. Now, why should that be so shocking after we had writers in Hebrew and people are writing essays in Hebrew? But he doesn't mean it just for the literati and the cognoscenti. He is not talking about Ahad Ha'am's elite. He's talking about every barber and every blacksmith and every farmer and every bookie and every pharmacist and every policeman and every filling station attendant. Everybody should speak Hebrew. Zionism, in order to work, really has to take the Hebrew language and put it into the mouths of every individual. Now, you must understand that this was a highly controversial subject. In the first place, the school system of Palestine, before World War I, was in the hands either of the Turks, which didn't amount to much, or of those large international Jewish agencies who in a way, consciously or unconsciously, operated as the tools of their governments. Maybe that's why the governments encouraged them. Maybe that's why they were there. The two famous organizations who were there, the largest ones, were the Hilfsverein, the German, Jewish, overseas uh, educational and relief agency, whose schools were taught in German, of course, the cultured language of modern 20th century Europe. And the Alliance, the French counterpart, the children in whose schools were obviously being taught in French, which was obviously the cultured language of 20th century Europe. And in the traditional schools, the yeshivas, children were being taught in Yiddish, which was obviously the language of most Jews, particularly if you came from Central Europe and thought that that's where almost all the Jews were, as they practically almost all were anyway. Now, who was speaking Hebrew? Nobody. Who thought that Hebrew ought to be the language of the common folk? Nobody. Nobody except this madman, 
And it's the only way to describe it. Because he made his wife, or induced his wife, or talked his wife into a pact that they would never speak anything but Hebrew to one another. And that when their child grew up, their child would hear nothing spoken in their house but Hebrew. And that they would speak nothing to Hebrew, uh, they would speak nothing to anyone when they got to Palestine except Hebrew, until everyone learned to speak Hebrew. Now, mind you, one has come across Jewish daring. I hope Eliezer ben Yehuda will forgive me for using a Yiddish word at this point, although it's actually Hebrew. But this is what you call Jewish chutzpah. This is what you call arrogance, presumption. He's not going to talk to anyone unless they talk Hebrew. So he couldn't even take a haircut. Because the barber wouldn't talk Hebrew to him. The barber won't talk Hebrew to him, he won't talk to the barber. The barber will talk Hebrew to him, he will talk Hebrew and then take a haircut. Now, this is the kind of fanatic we are dealing with. Who gives his entire life to the Hebrew language in Palestine, who gave what little money he had, always lived from hand to mouth, published a newspaper, in Hebrew of course, and decided that there ought to be a modern Hebrew dictionary. Now, I don't know if you understand what is involved in doing a Hebrew dictionary. For certain words, it is easy to find words. Terebin, covenant, uh, sanctification, and simpler words like donkey and barn. Uh, you know, you have the Bible there. But where do you find a word like dictionary? There is no word for dictionary in the Bible. How do you find such a word? You have to invent one. And among the other things that Eliezer Ben Yehuda did, he not only wrote the dictionary, but he invented the word for it. And he invented many of the words in it. He takes good Hebrew words like milah, meaning word, and then takes the traditional ending, the substantive ending, on, and coins a milah, on, which becomes milon, and a milon, a word thing, is a dictionary. And the same thing with airplane. You have avir, avira, meaning air. So you put an on on it, and you get aviron, an air thing, which is obviously an airplane. Now I say that because you have to realize that as Eliezer ben Yehuda began to convert the incoming waves of Zionists, the idealists who were going to carry this out to his point of view, it's true they could begin to speak Hebrew and in many things they could converse. But when you started to run a blacksmith's shop, or when you were a carpenter, if you wanted to get involved in any of the modern technical problems, you had to create a whole section of language. And this is partially what he did. He ransacked the Hebrew books, not only of the Bible, the Mishnah, of the Midrash, but all of the various medieval writings that he could find. After all, there had been Jewish scientists and mathematicians and doctors looking for Hebrew words. The famous dictionary was not finished until a very few years ago, I think almost eight or ten years after his death. And there it is today, this monumental dictionary in 16 volumes. It's not the best dictionary of Hebrew today. But the reason for that is that all the other lexicographers can go to Eliezer ben Yehuda's dictionary and improve on it. To make the first dictionary, particularly when the language isn't there, and to make it the standard of Jewish life, this is the accomplishment of Eliezer ben Yehuda. But it's interesting to see the way in which this man, who spearheaded the entire fight, achieved his victory. The crucial battle came with the school that the Hilfsverein had sponsored in Haifa. They had a very fine high school there and a conflict came up about the Hilfsverein sponsoring it and uh, the teachers decided that there was some difficulty about the way the Hilfsverein was carrying it on and the like until finally the teachers said we want the language of instruction to be Hebrew. Mind you, there were no algebra books in Hebrew. There were no chemistry books in Hebrew written on a child's level. 
but the language of instruction is going to be Hebrew. And the officers of the Hillsborough said, don't be silly. You can't teach children in Hebrew. There aren't adequate instructional materials. They'll learn a language that they can't use later. What German is the language of educated men. And the teachers of the Hillsborough, the Zionist teachers, went on strike. And it was one of the great strikes in Jewish history. Because when it was done, the Hilfsverein, for one reason or another, withdrew from the school. And the Zionist organization had to take over the school, and then they had to make good on the boast to teach in Hebrew. That was the beginning of an educational system, which after a while the World Zionist Organization and its various branches built up in Palestine, later the State of Israel, in which the language of instruction was Hebrew. This was the critical battle in which the issue of the, the Jewish settlement in Palestine demonstrated its insistence upon Hebrew as a language. Now, if I haven't made the point clear enough, let me reverse it and, and put it this way. Supposing, as many people had wanted, the language of the state of Israel were Yiddish today, would it make any real difference in the spirit and the culture of the state of Israel? Now, I don't know, one of you may be a very strong Yiddishist uh, and the lover of Yiddish. I think it would make a considerable difference. It would make a considerable difference in saying we speak and talk and react out of the language of the Bible and the Mishnah and the Midrash and the biblical commentaries and the like, or we speak out of a language which is ultimately derived of all things from German which is a kind of a Jewish creation out of German. It's a difference between a culture which is somehow indigenous and authentic and uniquely Jewish and one which, while it's Jewish, yet derives out of another people. This was the victory that Eliezer ben Yehuda won. And it was a victory which has had its effect down to the present time. I think the the battle to make Hebrew the language of modern Jewish culture is one of the critical battles in which the idealists of all people won. And not only won, but achieved their goals. The fact that modern Hebrew culture is in Hebrew and not in Yiddish or German or French or Ladino, which it might very well have been, is one of its great glories. And even the critics of the State of Israel admit that one of its most unusual accomplishments has been the revival of the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is not like Gaelic, somehow a, a relic of the past, which it, you know, it seems that you are more stubborn about than is really there. The observers, even the semi-anti-Semitic uh, observers who like to poke fun at the State of Israel, or at least to uh, point out all its shortcomings, are willing to say that they seem to feel that Hebrew is, you know, it, it's really alive. It says what needs to be said. You can get a banana or an ice cream cone or insult one another in it, and it's really there. Now, thus the first part of the problem was solved. The first part of the problem of making the Hebrew language a modern language was solved and uh, is still being solved. Eliezer ben Yehuda set up very early, and there continues to this day a famous Vav HaLashon, um, a, a language council, an official language council, to decide on what really is the correct word for thermonuclear in Hebrew. And it publishes lists from time to time in various trades, in various uh, sciences, in, in various spheres of life. Uh, and this is the final arbiter on the Hebrew language and its correct form and the like. And, uh, Eliezer ben Yehuda was its first president. It continues on up to the present day, although the process is not quite as, as drastic as it once had to be. It's the other problem which has now become the more acute problem. We all know Hebrew is alive. But the problem has been, what shall be the content that is poured into this Hebrew language? Now, it's very interesting. If you look at the problem of content, of, the, of what it is that we express with the Hebrew, 
I think it's easier to use the poets as a barometer than anything else. For some reason, I guess because their craft demands sensitivity and nuance and emotion. The poets are apparently almost always the best barometer of an age. Sometimes not. But even today, one may dislike the beatniks, but you have to pay a certain amount of attention to it as a phenomenon of our culture, as an indicator of what is going on in our culture. Now, the poets are therefore, in a way, the best indicator. It happens that we've got some good ones to talk about, are a good indicator, in any case, of what was happening in Jewish culture at this time. And I want to take two of them, whom I think are the, the more indicative poets. It's interesting to, what, to see what they did with the question of content. The first one about whom I want to speak rather b briefly is Saul Chernofovsky. Now, Chernofovsky is a good example of a man who uses the Hebrew language in a modern way and for a modern content. What could be more modern than Chernofovsky's attitude toward the world, which is, namely, an attitude of rebellion from all the values of the Jewish past. Rebellion and independence and thinking for oneself is about as characteristic a trait of modern man as there could possibly be. Uh, an attempt to look down on the cultures that, uh, of the past, the conventional values, and to emphasize one's own. This, I think, is rather common to most cultural adventurers in our time. But remember that the point here is that he's not just a critic of what's going on in the ghetto. To the contrary, he is an expressor of other motifs. This is what makes him so interesting. And what are the motifs which concern him? Well, in brief, and a little too simply, Hellenism over Hebraism. He is for the Greeks against the Jews. He's like that wonderful story which is told of the man who was complaining about the rabbi who was preaching a sermon about Moses leading the, Jew, leading the Jews uh, out of uh, Egypt. And every time the rabbi would say, and he brought them through the Red Sea, led them toward the land of Israel, this man would mutter and shake his head and say, oh no, not again. Or how stupid. He's not going to do it that way. And finally, after the sermon, the rabbi asked the gentleman, would he mind please explaining what all the muttering was about? And the gentleman said, well, rabbi, don't you see? Uh, here's Moses leading the Jews out of Egypt uh, toward the land of Israel again. If he'd only turn left instead of right, we'd all be living on the Riviera. <laughs> Now, in a way, that's Chernofovsky's complaint. Instead of going to Palestine, he should have gone to Greece. The values which were created in Palestine, the biblical values are not for him. What does he want? He wants air. He wants nature. He wants muscles. He wants beauty, aesthetics. Enough of this moralizing already and of this tedious spirituality. What he wants is the feel of a man against the universe, of, uh, of the wind through the trees, of, of the hard rocks under one's feet, of the, of the stream coursing down over the hillside. And he writes about that in Hebrew. He takes Hebrew and he glories in the universe. He glories in what it means to be natural and physical and, and no God and no ethics and, and no prophets and just Love that world. And that's what he does. Not hesitating on occasion to take a small crack at the Jews. Uh, there's one poem which I can't quite remember in its translation, which, uh, in which he describes the glories of the universe and how wonderful it is. And uh, really, if there is a God, he must have been a wonderful God until the Jews caught him and bound him in phylacteries. <laughs> Gorgeous little touch beautiful little satanic barb. But you see how nicely that little poetic way of putting it does. Notice how poetic it is. It's not you that bind yourself with the tefillin. What you're really doing is you're tying God up and you're limiting him back and, and you're holding him from the universe, which is his, you and your dark, dingy, narrow synagogues. Get out! See the world in the light. Now, what is this? This is a fresh voice. This is a new spirit. It's a different ethos. 
Well, that's modern. Really, how much more modern could one be, not only in rebellion, not just a, by what he's against, but by what he's for? He's for loving the world, for appreciating nature and the natural universe. So, really, this is modern poetry. And he is but one of a whole score of modern poets who manage to say that modern Jewish culture can really be modern. And as one reads Chernochovsky, in a way, the argument of Eliezer ben Yehuda seems right. Namely, when you read him, and he says this in Hebrew, somehow he seems like a Jew. It's Greek. And you know he's complaining about being a Jew, but you know it's a Jew complaining about being a Jew. I admit it's paradoxical, and I'm not quite sure that the modern generation of Israeli readers who are accustomed to a different kind of literature feel this way. But as one reads uh, Chernochovsky, if one is only acquainted with the older generation of modern uh, Hebrew writers, do you feel that Chernochovsky is still somehow a Jew? Now, it's interesting that a man like Chernochovsky, however, and others like him, the various critics, the various persons who took a particular phase of modern life and thought and expressed it, do not become the key poets in the Jewish tradition. They, they somehow don't rise to the level that Bialik rose to. You may speak about all the other poets and all the other essayists and all the other writers, but when you get to Bialik, you have to take a step up. It's interesting to see why Bialik occupies that unique niche. The unparalleled, unique national Jewish poet of this period. Now, why is that? I think the answer is because he was able for his day, but not as we shall see in a moment, for ours. He was able for his day not only to be as modern as Chernochovsky, but also somehow to serve as a bridge to the tradition. You knew when you were dealing with Bialik, you didn't have to look and hunt and worry about it. You were dealing with an authentic Jew who was coming out of the tradition into modern times. When the poet spoke, it wasn't just because he spoke in Hebrew, but the way he spoke and his attitude, and very often his subject matter which, even if he treated it from a modern way, nonetheless denominated him a man of the tradition. I think that the reason that Bialik is the poet laureate of uh, Jewish tradition in uh, the early part of the 20th century is because he was so clearly a Jew. To give an example, two of Bialik's great poems do poetically what no one else has been able to do any other way. That, of course, is what poetry is for. Bialik has two poems, one called, and I'm just using two as an example. One is called Hamatmid. Now go translate that into English. This already shows the beauty of writing this in, in uh, Hebrew. Hamatmid, uh, if I may put it in Bialik's terms. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that Eliezer ben Yehuda was so impressed with the Sephardic pronunciation that he heard among the Algerians that he decided that the pronunciation that was more appropriate was Sephardic, and as a result, he spoke Sephardic, and he got everybody else to speak Sephardic, and as a result, that is the reason why today, Jews in the state of Israel speak Sephardic Hebrew, and you and I are under pressure to learn it that way, and probably over a period of time, if you want my guess, we'll all be using the Sephardic pronunciation one way or another. Bialik was still Ashkenazic. He spoke Ashkenazi Hebrew, and therefore it wasn't Hamatmid, but Hamasmid. What is a masmid? A masmid is a perpetual student, one not who just keeps on going to school, but who doesn't stop studying, goes to the uh, house of study, the base of Medrash, and stands in the base of Medrash, just keeps studying day and night, 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 day and night. That's all he does. That's his devotion. And this is Bialik's poet. It is a poem how late at night everyone else is out of the base of Midrash and there are shadows there, but there is a figure swaying back and forth and there is a candle there's flickering on the walls and he goes on forever and ever studying. Well, my language is not very good, but supposing you had poetry for that. Supposing you could evoke and arouse the figures of what the eternity of Jewish study has meant. But in modern Hebrew, lovely, 
limpid modern Hebrew. This is a completely modern poem for that day. And it does it beautifully. Or take another poem on the, on the base of Medrash itself, the study house, the room in which Jews would study, particularly Eastern Central Europe. Here is a poem, a modern poem, but which takes an old tradition, namely that there were always Jews sitting and studying and there were shelves lined with books, big volumes and bigger volumes and bigger, bigger volumes and commentaries on the commentaries on the commentaries and always someone adding a point that was added to a point that was added to a point that was added to a point carrying on an unbroken tradition of study. Now suppose you take this theme and you take this Jewish institution and you write a modern poem out of it. Well that's what Bialik did. Bialik was able to say look at the glories of the Jewish tradition. There it is. And put it in modern language. At the same time, if he had only been a capturer of the past, he could not have been the modern Jewish poet. Why? Because authenticity was, in a way, the less desired thing. The more important thing for modern Hebrew culture was to be modern, was to be up to date, was to be marching toward the future. It is rather extraordinary in Bialik that he's not like Chernochovsky, one who has to seek a new salient, but can somehow have a legitimate uh, chain to the tradition. And where does this come out? This comes out in those heroic, almost prophetic poems which he wrote to the Jewish people. The ones in which he called them, begged them, plead them, harangued them, scolded them, castigated them for not becoming a modern people. There are a whole series of them. But the chief of them is the famous poem that he wrote called The City of Slaughter. In 1904, there was a pogrom in Kishinev. Not many Jews were killed by contemporary standards. You know, we are used to this thing now by the hundreds and thousands we don't get impressed. I think the victims numbered all told in all the various pogroms a little over a hundred when all was said and done. But the world was aroused that at the beginning of the 20th century it was possible that there could be a pogrom in modern 20th century city and the United States was aroused and all over Europe there were protests. What bothered Bialik? What bothered Bialik was that the Jews took it. They just stayed there and waited to be butchered. And then when it was over, they just limply stayed there and waited for the next round. That the people didn't rouse itself, not only physically but spiritually, and say there's no reason for us to do this. We ought to emancipate ourselves. Auto-emancipation ought to be the cry of our time. We're going to wait for the government to give us rights, We're going to wait for somebody to make us modern people, We're going to wait for somebody to train us to be human beings. So Bialik wrote a poem, The City of Slaughter. It's not Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. It really isn't. But it had that effect in its time. It was the closest thing to the voice of prophecy calling to this people, telling it what it ought to do, that had been heard. This is the new voice of Hebrew culture. It is a voice which doesn't just look to the past, but which looks forward, and which calls upon the people to do it itself, which speaks in terms of human values and human striving, and the human effort to create the kind of person that ought to be. So Bialik, you see, was a rather unusual combination. He was modern Hebrew culture personified because he combined the two major problems in an unusual way. He not only could use the Hebrew language, but could use it in a way which was authentically related to the spirit of Jewish tradition, and yet at the same time move forward into a, a new kind of Hebrew culture. 
He was a legitimate spokesman of the Jewish past facing forward into the Jewish future. And what he did in his poems, by the way, he did in his essays uh, also. He, he did a number of extraordinary things. He tried to find a way toward that modern Hebrew culture, which was the best of the past and of the future. He did a very famous volume of the best of the Midrash, it might have been called in English, the, the Midrash book, the Sefer uh, Haggadah, uh, which became a book that any man who wanted to know something about the Midrashic tradition could use. It was indexed and it had subject matters and it was organized in a very interesting way so that all of a sudden the rabbinic tradition came into the hands of the average man. He started to work on the mission. He was going to take the mission and vocalize the text. And not only vocalize it, but publish a simple commentary so that a modern man could get some sense out of the mission. He believed that there, without taking the religion of it, one could take the entire Jewish past and translate it into modern terms. Now that was Bialik's dream. And the novelists and the poets who have followed have all followed in that direction. They have followed in the direction of trying to move forward into the future with using the Hebrew language in a modern way. Where they have not followed Bialik, and this is where the contemporary problem of Hebrew culture arises, is the question as to whether or not modern Hebrew culture has to have roots in the ghetto tradition. After all, the Midrash is a non-Israeli product. The Talmud was produced outside the state of Israel. The medieval literature and all the life of the ghetto was produced outside the state of Israel. Now the problem is if one is in the state of Israel and one has the Hebrew language and one is living as a Jew among Jews, why does one need to bother about all this kind of stuff? Why can't one simply write a novel the way one writes a contemporary novel without getting involved in all this uh, kind of diaspora interests? Why can't one simply speak in terms of those values which are dear to a person growing up in the state of Israel today? The modern Hebrew culture, which Bialik foresaw, is there. But the question is as to what its roots are to be. One takes, for example, a, the modern Hebrew novel, which uh, caused such a furor about a year ago, The Days of Tsiklag, a uh, two-volume novel of the uh, Arab-Israeli war. And it's a stream of consciousness novel of modern soldiers facing a certain uh, salient connected with the biblical king Siklag and of what goes through their minds during the period of this battle. I have friends who are consider themselves Hebraists in the New York area who admit frankly that there are parts of it they simply can't read and understand even though they've been reading and, and uh, dealing with modern Hebrew literature in contemporary times. Why can't they read it? They don't understand the Hebrew. It's a kind of a growing, flowing, modern, Arab, Arabized Hebrew, a kind of created Hebrew which is moving along that uh, unless you're somehow part of the stream, you can't quite follow it. Now what's Jewish about it? It's a typical example of the problem of whether or not just being in Hebrew makes a book Jewish. Now Bialik didn't have that problem. Bialik combined the past and the present. And while modern Hebrew culture has on the whole tried to absorb and understand its traditional Jewish roots, the problem has now come to the fore in a generation of Jewish writers and poets who have grown up in the state of Israel, who didn't know the diaspora, who didn't know the life of Central and Eastern Europe, and who don't want it. Who want to have the kind of culture that is meaningful in their society, which is by and large cut off from those roots, which is modern and which is Hebrew, but is it Jewish? So that you see, Achad Ha'am's problem still remains. Achad Ha'am's problem of the identity of Jewish culture, which he defined in spiritual terms, still remains. Because if we are going to say, as Achad Ha'am would have said, 
and as many as I understand said after him, that a Jew is a Jew today by virtue of participating in modern Hebrew culture. Then it is clear he learns modern Hebrew, something of a problem as far as dealing with the mass of Americans is concerned, but leave that out, that's only a technical and practical problem. He learns modern Hebrew, but then what has he got? He has materials which are being produced in Hebrew, which may turn out to be exactly the same kind of thing as is going on in Spain or France, except in another language. Now what does his Jewishness consist of? His Jewishness then consists of his ties with the people producing that particular kind of novel and the language in which it's expressed. Is that sufficient? And this is the critical problem with that definition. To say that we are Jews by Hebrew culture in terms of this aspect of Hebrew culture seems unsatisfactory. And at the moment there is no contemporary Bialik. Bialik is now considered to be somehow old-fashioned, a little musty and out of date in the state of Israel. You know that sentimental kind of person whom every culture requires who loved grandma in the good old days. He is kind of the John Greenleaf Whittier of the state of Israel. What could you say worse about a poet than saying that he is as sentimental and old-fashioned as John Greenleaf Whittier? I don't even know if the children in the public school today study him as I did when I was a boy. But until there is produced in the state of Israel that kind of culture which is not just Hebraic and not just Israeli but which is somehow Jewish, then Achar Ha'am's question and Chaim Nachman Bialik's achievement remains a serious and thoughtful question, even to those who are devoted to the state of Israel, even to those who are devoted to the Hebrew language, and perhaps somehow particularly to them. But here we must leave this question, uh, because in succeeding sessions we must now go on to certain other themes. And now the rest of the time is yours for questions. Yes? Well, something you said about uh, the Arabic influence in the Hebrew, where the Hebrew of the future be a kind of a Latino or a Yiddish, so it becomes so changed. Well, uh, no, I don't think it will become a Latino or a Yiddish, although I'm no great linguistic prophet. Um, Prophecy is a little dangerous on this score. We do know that Hebrew was finally overtaken by Aramaic after perhaps a millennium on the soil of Palestine, but Aramaic was a, uh, a cousin language and an international language. Now, one might argue that by the same token, if the Jews stay in the state of Israel long enough, Arabic being the language of that part of the world, the Jews may tend to give up Hebrew and eventually take on Arabic, which is a cousin language to Hebrew as well. And then this is the question of how tenaciously the Jews will hold to the national ideal. Hebrew came into being not because it was easy. Today it's much easier than it used to be. You want to learn Hebrew, go to the state of Israel, you'll live for six months, nine months, a year, and if you make any effort at all, you can learn Hebrew and learn it well and have it for the rest of your life. But Hebrew didn't come to be that way. When Eliezer ben Yehuda went there, he suffered rather serious hardship. Now, if the Jews of the state of Israel hold to the national ideal, which says that Hebrew is our language, and it's the language we wish to speak, and it is the language of our people and our folk, and particularly if it continues to serve its function, there's no reason to believe that Hebrew should disappear or go out, but that it will have influences from surrounding languages, particularly languages which are close to it, such as Arabic, in which there are many roots that are quite similar to the Hebrew roots. This seems fairly reasonable too. Languages grow and change. It's going to be an interesting problem to see what happens to language in the world as a whole. Now that we begin to mix and mingle, as we do with various cultures, most languages begin to have a rather strong influence from other languages. 
What the eventual outcome will be is probably not Esperanto, but maybe something that will approach that someday. Who knows? Yes? In regard to the question as to what the nature of uh, Hebrew, how Jewish Hebrew literature will be, is it the fact that the um, children of Israel and all of us studying the law are grounded in, uh, in fact, in reading of the education based on biblical uh, literature and the heritage, the spiritual heritage of the Bible, and also uh, in the history, on the history class? Uh, the content of the history classes contain the recent, well, say the last thousand years of Jewish history. And the fact that just now there is a, a desire to separate from that is because the recent suffering has created that reaction. But as time goes on, you all be you have been part of the heritage of the national memory. So what do you do? Yeah, I share your faith. <laughs> um, that's all I can say. Yes, I too believe that. Uh, after a certain reaction which insists upon, you know, establishing itself as independent and not, you know, we're on our own and this is the real Judaism living in the land and the light and the values of outside the land are really ours. After that period of rebellion, there should be a natural and normal return uh, to the, toward the more traditional values. And yes, it is true that the children growing up in the Israeli schools do know the Bible and do know something of Jewish history uh, in some of the schools. Uh, they even know a considerable uh, amount of the rabbinic literature. But, if you study the Bible as a national document, do you really know the Bible in a way which is somehow authentically Jewish? If the Bible is simply a tour guide to the land, and you block out all those references which are religious, are you being Jewish? Now, of course, I'm obviously speaking as a diaspora Jew, whose interpretation, as we shall return to it very shortly, is these days almost entirely religious. And I, as a diaspora Jew, have the view toward the Jews of the state of Israel that their use of the traditional material is warped, and that while I don't see how it's possible for anyone to study the Bible over a long period of time without having certain religious questions raised, on the other hand, that's just what they're trying to do. Now, I think it's fair to face the problem. I don't despair, and I'm not stopping my contribution to the United Jewish Appeal, and I'm not joining the American Council for Judaism, but I do think it's fair to face the problem. If you are really troubled by the question of what it means to be a Jew in modern times, then you can't, I think, easily accept the answer, you know, just quickly, that if you read modern Hebrew books and poets, you're a Jew. In some sense, which is authentic to the centuries that have gone before, because it's entirely possible that a Jewish culture might be created and that you might be participating in a Hebrew culture which knows nothing of Achad Ha'am's spirit, much less nothing of the Jewish religious outlook on life, much less even has any interest in the kind of sociological and communal and historic activities of Jews in the, the diaspora, particularly in the ghetto period of the diaspora. There's a problem there, is what I want to say. And since I shall not hesitate to point out the problems of trying to be a Jew religiously, I also think it's important to point out the problem of trying to be a Jew by culture. And you notice, uh, I did not lay great stress upon the problem of being, of learning Hebrew, which for most Jews in the United States, to learn Hebrew enough to be able to participate in modern Hebrew culture is, I think, a considerable problem and challenge. In other words, I don't think it would be a mass answer. Yes? Please. Yes. 
Well, I, I just wonder if that's enough. Can you have, I mean, now, speaking as a diaspora Jew, committed to the point of view that uh, I think makes sense in the diaspora, and jumping ahead now before we discuss the evolution of modern Jewish religious thought, I just don't see how you can have a Hebrew culture that is a Jewish culture. Israeli culture you can have. Hebrew culture maybe you can have. Can you have a Jewish culture which isn't permeated by religion? That doesn't mean everybody has to be religious, but it does mean that the basic ethos of the community has to have it. That, I think, is the critical problem, and I think it's a problem which is not at all resolved. Any other questions? Yes. On the question of Hebrew, and I'm a reactionary Ashkenazi, I guess, uh, with regard to pronunciation, was there, was there uh, do you recall, any opposition to with this pronunciation as a, a form of um, uh, degenerative version of resistance? I, I view the uh, Israeli Hebrew, put it in blunt terms, as Harlem English. Now, uh, you throw away all kinds of sounds. I'm not quite sure way. that I understand that phrase. It's a kind of English which some people understand, but it doesn't have all the vowels the rest of us use. And the same as Hebrew here, the Israeli Hebrew. They are quite a number I want of you know, I've come from spending the day at a conference on how to improve intergroup relations, and I don't think that phrase does it. <laughs> but go ahead. There's such a thing as going too blind on that, too, but let's not get into that. Let's just say that the Hebrew, the, uh, the Sephardic Hebrew, uh, which seems to throw away quite a number of vowels or consonant sounds or mixes them together. Uh, this seems to me to be going backwards rather than forward with greater uh, communication. You see, you end up with, with mumblings rather than the distinct sounds which can be separated. Now, was there any, uh, the, what was the nature of the fight, if any, on that, and how did he win his battle for his way? Well, there was a considerable opposition to uh, using the Sephardic pronunciation mostly because most people knew Ashkenazi Hebrew. They didn't like it. The same fight that goes on in a synagogue today when you try to get people to pronounce their uh, Hebrew in Sephardic. Exactly the same fight, except that uh, there the fight was that people knew it and were trained to it the other day, uh, the other way. Here it is that it's largely a question of emotion and memory. Um, now, why did he win? I don't know. I guess because it was the will of the community that this should be it. Maybe it was a means of cutting themselves off from their experience with the Hebrew language in Central and Eastern Europe. Maybe it was one way of demonstrating their will to make Hebrew a new language and yet in the form. On the other hand, it is true that the majority of the inhabitants of the land were Sephardim. And after all, the Sephardic Jews do pronounce Hebrew that way. And from their point of view, your contention that the Hebrew doesn't sound right, or that you would try in some means or another to logically say that the Ashkenazi is a more desirable pronunciation, you know, it can't bear up. Scientifically, there is no way of demonstrating the uh, greater adequacy of Ashkenazi over Sephardi Hebrew. And in Eliezer ben Yehuda's time, it was thought that the Sephardic pronunciation was the more authentic original pronunciation. That's probably the intellectual reason why it won out. Yes? Excuse me, I will come to you just one second. Oh, sure. They're all translated into Hebrew by now. 
The translations of Shalom Aleichem into Hebrew, for example, are considered as great a classic as the original in Yiddish. The, the translation, like the, you know, the German translations of Shakespeare, leading many Germans to think that Shakespeare wrote in German. <laughs> One last question over here. Yes. Uh, I believe that either that is a mis, what shall I say, quotation of, of Rabbi Rose, or else he did not say what he meant to say, because those statistics are not quite correct, and I shall give them to you later in the year when we discuss them. The status in Israel is far simpler. It is a question of traditional Central European orthodoxy, or nothing. And this is a problem which we shall take up when we discuss uh, the rise of the socialist Zionism, which was uh, atheistic, essentially, for good socialist reasons. So that, by and large, the conflict has been either between being traditionally Jewish in some Eastern European way, or of being modern and socialist and atheistic. And that's why the number of traditionally observant Jews in the state of Israel is variously estimated at about 10%, with the other 90% being Jews by anything but religion. And the question of some form of liberal or conservative uh, Jewry, uh, Jewish religious point of view in Israel, is one of the great problems of the day there. But we will come back to that. I hope you will forgive us, but we must end a little early this evening. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.